Hi, my name is Joanna Ball, and I'm the president of the Cascade Chapter of the National Association of Teachers of Singing. I'd like to thank OMTA for inviting me to share some ideas with you about how to teach voice lessons online. In this video, I will cover some of the challenges and benefits of teaching online, as well as how to set up your studio and some ways to adapt your teaching so that it's successful in this new paradigm. Most of us are new to this online platform, and it might feel a little bit daunting. But the good news is, it's possible, and you don't have to be a technology wizard to be successful. With just a few tips and tricks, you'll be on your way in no time. One of the most challenging aspects of this is the emotional reality. We miss being with our students in person, and it's difficult not knowing when we might be able to have lessons in person again. It means we have to adapt many of our habitual teaching strategies, which might initially feel like a big hurdle. On the other hand, there are many positive opportunities for students to develop skills of independence. From this newfound independence, their confidence will increase. You can incorporate much more ear training into lessons. Their pitch accuracy will improve. You can strengthen their knowledge of music literacy and spend extra time working on expressive storytelling. There are many benefits for us as voice teachers as well. Online lessons enable us to maintain consistency and meaningful connection with our students. We never again have to miss lessons due to inclement weather. It also gives us the opportunity to think outside the box and discover approaches to teaching that may actually be so successful that you'll want to continue using them once we're able to have lessons in person again. The setup for online teaching can be as simple or complex as you desire. Here is one example of a very simple teacher scenario. First and foremost, you'll need a screen with a built-in camera. Ideally, a larger screen is better so you can see your student more clearly to monitor body alignment and breathing. A laptop or iPad work best because they are mobile and you can set them up at or near your piano. Internet is obviously a must. You may not have much control over the location that you teach in your house, but if at all possible, try to choose a place with a good Wi-Fi signal strength and consider increasing the speed of your current internet connection. I'll chat more later on about how the signal strength and speed of your internet can affect the quality of a lesson. At the very least, try to limit the number of devices drawing on the Wi-Fi connection on both your end and the students. The more devices that are taking up bandwidth, the more you'll encounter technical glitches. Microphones can be helpful, but are not required. A simple USB microphone, such as the Blue Yeti, is a fabulous option that can hook right into your computer. One benefit of this particular mic is that you can plug headphones into the base of the microphone so you hear a clearer transmission, not only of your student's voice, but of your own, which can help preserve your own vocal health. Many people have found that they speak quite loudly or even shout at their screens to be heard in lessons. This is a simple, helpful solution to prevent vocal fatigue. Here's an example of another beautiful setup, which includes multiple microphones, stands, and an audio interface. It may be that you already have some of this sound equipment sitting around at home from past performances, and you can put it right to use for your online teaching. Remember that the most basic setup can be very effective. Play around to figure out what suits your needs best. You can flatten the music rack on your piano, creating a flat desk space so you can look straight ahead at the screen while playing at the keyboard. You can utilize books and file boxes to raise up your screen for a standing desk option. And you can set your laptop or iPad on a music stand nearby to keep your music rack free on the piano. The student setup can be even simpler. For a screen, they can use anything with a built-in camera. 
laptops, iPads, and even phones can work quite well. Ideally, the larger the screen, the better, but remember that the simplest scenario will do the trick. Have the student position the camera so that it's level with their eyes if possible. It's helpful for their whole torso to be visible, allowing you to give feedback about alignment and breathing. They will also need internet. And the great thing is students can have lessons literally anywhere that they can find a quiet space. External microphones are useful for students to have, but they're not a requirement to have an effective lesson. If a relatively inexpensive mic is in their budget, one like the blue snowball or another USB mic, they can work by plugging them directly into their laptops. Headsets with a built-in microphone can also work. An external microphone will create the clearest sound for you to listen to and diagnose technical issues. Depending on the quality of their device's internal microphones, however, the quality of the sound can be quite adequate without an extra mic. If they have several devices available, try each one and determine which has the best internal microphone. Sometimes a phone's microphone provides sound quality superior to a laptop. I recommend trying each option to see what works best. There are several options available to use as far as platforms go. Probably the most heavily used one is Zoom video conferencing. Other options include FaceTime, Google Hangouts, Skype, and Facebook. These interfaces are all available for free and are very effective platforms with some changes to your teaching strategies. These adaptations, which we'll soon discuss, are necessary because of a sizable sound delay that you will discover if you try to accompany your student while they sing. One additional resource you might look into is at voicelessons.com. This is a pay to use platform which has created technology that actually eliminates the sound delay. You would need a digital keyboard MIDI hookup for this approach. Zoom is the preferred platform for many instructors. It's completely free for up to two users at a time. This means you and one student can use the platform for as long of a lesson as you want. Once you add a third participant, however, meetings can proceed for up to 40 minutes. Past that point, you'll need to upgrade to a paid subscription. The video quality and connection of Zoom is fairly stable. Students can record their lessons with video and sound, and then they can re-watch their lesson. This is a fabulous teaching tool. It also enables you to share your screen view with a student so that you can utilize visual aids and mark digital music copies, much like you would in a normal lesson. You and your students will need to make some audio adjustments in your Zoom settings. This video from the Royal Academy of Music in Denmark explains these crucial sound settings, which make a huge difference in the sound quality. I cannot stress this enough. Without making these adjustments in Zoom, the sound quality suffers immensely. Long notes cut out and the sound shrinks to a whisper in the loudest and the most dramatic sections of your students' pieces. Check out the video. These settings are a game changer. Remember that because of the sound delay, you will not be able to play along with your student while they sing. This is a huge change from the traditional voice lesson format, especially when it comes to vocal exercises and repertoire. For warm-ups, you can try pre-recording personalized warm-ups for each of your students. There's ample free recording software available to use on your computer or iPad, such as Audacity for PC users or GarageBand for Apple users. You can also record a voice memo on your phone and send it to your student. You can choose existing exercises on YouTube that are appropriate for your student, and some smartphone accompaniment apps also include warm-up tracks. My favorite strategy is the classic play and echo. First, demonstrate the vocal exercise by playing or singing it. The student then echoes back, and you can work up and down the scale by the typical half-step progression. The student may feel more exposed utilizing this method and require quite a bit of positive feedback and encouragement as they build confidence in their pitch matching independence. 
once you and your student get a feel for it, this method actually feels quite like the regular flow of a lesson. One tip is to make use of shorter exercises. Sustained one note or three note exercises work quite well and allow you to make a significant amount of technical progress. When it comes to repertoire, students must have a pre-recorded accompaniment that they play on their end of the lesson. For some teachers, this is great news. We don't have to use a large part of our brains to play the accompaniments. Instead, we can focus solely on our students' singing. Again, you can make your own accompaniment tracks using programs such as GarageBand or Audacity, or you can pay collaborative pianist colleagues to create accompaniment tracks for you. Students can also purchase apps for their phones. App Companist is a popular one for iPhones, and for Androids, there's a beta version called Accompanist App. These are great for students because the library of accompaniments is enormous. They can adjust the tempo of the song, transpose the key, and choose to have the melody played as well. For students singing pop songs, karaokeversion.com is a great pay-to-use option for instrumental tracks, which can also be transposed. Virtually Vocal is another subscription site, which includes vocal exercises, accompaniments, and additional teaching tools you might find useful. If at all possible, have the student play the accompaniment on a different device than they are having their lesson on. Otherwise, the sound can become distorted and it's difficult to hear your student sing over the accompaniment. For the best sound quality and volume control, have your student play their accompaniment through a Bluetooth speaker. To easily go back and repeat a section of a song, have students write in time marks throughout the sheet music so they know the time elapsed on the accompaniment track for various key points during the song. Sometimes you might not be sure if what you're hearing is a technological glitch or a singer technique issue. Have the student repeat that section and decide how to proceed from there. Slow Wi-Fi can distort the tempo you perceive sometimes. As long as the accompaniment track and the voice are in alignment, you can be sure it's a Wi-Fi issue, not a student timing issue. Take it with a grain of salt and try to keep a sense of humor. To help lessons run smoothly, make a checklist for resources students need to have ready for their lessons. Remind them to have their accompaniment tracks downloaded and ready to access so you don't have to waste time waiting for them to sort through emails and files to find them. Consider making a shared Google Drive file as a way of organizing their materials. In it, you can put their personalized warm-ups, sight singing exercises, lesson notes and assignments, personal video messages, and their purchased digital copies of music. You might find this to be an excellent strategy for students who have trouble remembering to bring their music to lessons. At first, teaching through a screen may not feel as energizing and personal as meeting face-to-face, -face, but these online lessons are a way we can keep connecting with our students, which is more important than ever during these challenging times of COVID-19. To improve a sense of connection with your student, whenever possible, speak directly into the camera. It'll be tempting to look at them in your own screen, and while that totally works, we know that direct eye contact is one of the most powerful forms of communication, and the student will have a stronger sense of connection with you if you're speaking to them into the camera directly rather than looking lower down at the picture of them on your screen. Spend time singing things the student knows and loves to reinforce positive feelings and a sense of accomplishment and joy in their lessons. When you're working on building technical skill and coordination with students, it's worth considering what we know about motor learning. In her book, Manual to Singing Voice Rehabilitation, Lita Sears reminds us about the three stages of motor learning or how we learn to coordinate a new skill. Stage one is the verbal or cognitive stage, when students need a lot of reminders from you as the teacher to reinforce the correct coordination. Oh, that was such a good low breath. Did you feel your belly expand like a balloon? Stage two is motor learning, when they start to have more of an awareness and can report back about whether they successfully carried out the new skill. For example, 
oops, I raised my shoulders on that inhalation. Stage three is the automatic stage where the coordination is habitual and they don't have to think about it. For instance, the consistency in the low breathing. In online teaching, we have to be extra patient with stage one. Glitches due to technology are bound to happen, and at times, the smooth pace at which we're accustomed to providing feedback and redirection for students may feel stunted. Keep goals simple and attainable. Slow down the pace. Build in pauses to allow for the time delay before you begin speaking. Don't give feedback while they are singing. Because of the time delay, this can feel clumsy, awkward, and therefore frustrating. But as Lita Sears reminds us, we know this is actually best practice anyway. Listen attentively. Take notes while the student is singing. And if you do need them to pause mid song, establish a gesture that signals them to stop. Stage two of motor learning is very helpful as you adjust your ears to teaching online. In the beginning stages, you may need to slightly recalibrate your perception of the sound you're hearing and assess it to see if it matches what the student is actually producing. Listen closely while they sing, then ask the student to provide feedback about how it felt and if it was on target. For instance, you could ask a more experienced singer, did it feel like your tongue pulled back on that E vowel? This will give you a chance to recalibrate your own perceptions through this new medium and see if they match up with the students. This can be especially useful with older or more advanced singers who have an established kinesthetic awareness of their bodies and who may be working on more refined technical skill. Here are a few ideas for how to tailor online lessons to the different learning styles. For kinesthetic learners and younger students especially, Keep things active. Have them move around, get silly, and use gestures like you would in regular lessons. Even adults can benefit from lightening the mood with silly facial expressions for warm-ups or expressive exercises. Have students sing phrases while conducting to physically exemplify the kind of articulation and dynamic contrast you would like them to sing with. For visual learners, you can utilize the screen share feature on Zoom to draw pictures or demonstrate how you want the student to annotate their own scores. For auditory learners, you can still model examples with your own voice. The student just won't be able to sing along with you without you experiencing a time delay on your end. Even so, Having them sing along despite the time delay can be a useful strategy to help students gain confidence and a sense of connection with you. Try sending them short video clips of you demonstrating trouble spots in their music. They can practice along to these videos to help fix tricky passages and foster a sense of connection with you from afar. You already likely utilize the strategies I'm about to share, and your approach will vary based on the age and skill of the student, but it's worth reinforcing a few elements within this new context of online teaching. When teaching students new songs, utilize existing recordings for students to familiarize themselves with the song. Teach songs line by line, copycat style. Play or demonstrate one short phrase and have the student echo it back. Repeat the phrase until they feel confident. Focus on small chunks of songs. If you're like me, during a typical lesson in person, you may be tempted to play through a whole song, supporting the student by playing their melody and jumping in to sing along when necessary. Students can catch on fairly quickly this way, but with online lessons, less is more. They may feel very insecure in this new lesson scenario, so set them up for success by working in short melodic segments that they will feel successful with, building from there. When teaching new songs, go back to basics. Empower students with the knowledge of how to learn songs and break it down into the layers. First, go over the words and pronunciation. Overdoing enunciation. It's a great time to work on diction. Next, learn the rhythms. This may be accomplished with words immediately 
Or if you want to build in rhythmic skills, this is a great opportunity to break it down even further. Next, learn the pitches. Then put the rhythm and pitches together on a neutral syllable like la 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 or di 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 di. Finally, one phrase at a time, put it all together slowly. Gradually increase the speed to the desired performance tempo. To help students get a handle on a new melody, check out these tools that students can use at home to practice. The Amazing Slow Downer is an app for Apple users that can slow down entire songs or segments of songs for students to zero in on and nail. You can also loop segments of songs for repetitive practice. If you've ever had a student learn the melody a wrong way, this can be a fabulous tool to build in the necessary repetition to relearn it. You can also reduce the speed of a YouTube video by clicking on the gear icon to change the settings. Adjust playback speed to be quarter, half, or three quarter speed. And as I mentioned earlier, variable tempos are also available in the accompanist apps. This is a great opportunity to focus on expression and storytelling. On Zoom, using the record feature, you can have students observe their own expressive choices. Have them watch YouTube performances of the songs you're working on to see what choices other performers make and try incorporating some new ideas. You can make a before and after video too, so the students can assess the effectiveness of their new ideas. And finally, be ready to help students create new goals. Now is the perfect time to try out new techie projects or just work on some nuts and bolts. This will help keep both you and your students motivated and inspired. Try having a virtual studio class to build a sense of community within your studio. Have a virtual recital on Zoom. Record and send songs to family members and friends. Practice and or prepare making audition videos. Learn new dream roles. Work on memorizing and perfecting new monologues. And improve language pronunciation. When you need more resources and inspiration along the way or want to connect with other voice teachers, here are some additional things to check out. Musictheory.net offers free music theory practice with exercises you can adapt to the level of your student. TheFullVoice.com has beautiful resources for the young singer. They have a podcast, workbooks, and sight singing books for younger singers, and many free downloadable materials. At Nats.org, there's a page with resources specific to teaching during COVID-19 and many fabulous discussions on relevant topics called Nats Chats. Check out Matt Edwards' blog to read his 10 ideas for online teaching. There are also many Facebook groups and pages to keep in touch with colleagues and share ideas. Check out the Professional Teachers group and VoiceLessons.com also has a page which includes a roundtable discussion, Coronavirus Edition, from March 12th with many useful ideas. Be sure to watch the video from the Royal Conservatory of Music in Denmark about the sound settings needed when making music on Zoom. And of course, I reference Lita Sears' book, Manual of Singing Voice Rehabilitation, A Practical Approach to Vocal Health and Wellness, which is an incredible resource. Navigating the new world of online teaching can be tiring. We are listening harder and problem solving in new ways and adjusting takes energy. But we're lucky, 10 or 15 years ago, this wouldn't have been possible to the same extent. And while we may not prefer online teaching, it is possible, and we can continue to be an important presence in our students' lives. So hang in there, reach out for support, and we'll adapt together.